So we heard a passage from Ezekiel that talks about this familiar image of God replacing hearts of stone with hearts of flesh and filling us with a spirit to then be God's people that God may also be our God. Those same themes are going to appear again in the reading for today from the lectionary from the gospel from Luke. But let's begin first with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious, ever-living God, be with us. In this place and in this time, silence any voice but your own. And open our hearts and spirits to your spirit. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Luke's gospel begins with all that Christmassy stuff, and then Jesus comes on the scene, and there's a long genealogy that we never read because we can't pronounce most of the names. And so in a real way, the gospel in the story of Jesus, as an adult particularly, starts in chapter 4. We're going to look at two parts of that chapter this week and next week. So here, Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Then Jesus filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, returned to Galilee. And the report about him spread through all the surrounding country, and he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll, and he found the place where it was written, quote, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Spirit has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were upon him. And then Jesus began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I'm going to talk today about a very Presbyterian thing. God's Holy Spirit. Now, you may think, actually, that spirit talk is something better for a Pentecostal church or maybe for a rousing Baptist revival, but I assure you that the idea of being filled with the Spirit is very Presbyterian. Now, to begin with, the question is, what comes to mind when I say the word spirit? Since spirit is by definition hard to picture. We tend to think of it always in terms of analogies, like air or wind or breath. We fill our lungs with a deep breath, and we imagine that in doing that, the spirit, the breath of life, is now moving within us. That's a very biblical idea as well. At our last session meeting, um, Elder Katie Haas Conrad read two scripture passages that said precisely this. She quoted Genesis 2, verse 7, that says, And then the Lord God formed the human from the dust of the ground and breathed into the nostrils the breath of life, and the human, Adama, became a living being. And she also read Job 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. The breath of life. That's perhaps how we most commonly think about this connection between us and God's own Spirit. But in some ways, this understanding is too passive, Writer Frederick Beekner has complained that our contemporary understanding of spirit is often pale and shapeless like an unmade bed. If God's spirit truly lives in us, then it has a power to it. It has an intentionality to it. It's not passive, 
but active. Imagine being, well, not now, but imagine being in a football stadium watching a Steelers game. Or imagine being in the arena watching the Penguins play hockey in a close match. There's a spirit active in that space, in that crowd that, that grabs hold of you, that lifts you up in the thrill of victory or pummels you down in the agony of defeat. That spirit is breath and the source of life, but spirit also gives us a particular type of life, a type of life that may be joyous, or defeated, may be exhilarated or exhausted, may be faithful or faithless. In general, spirit activity can be good or bad. It can be healing or it could be destructive. There's a big difference between the spirit of joy felt by a crowd that lines the street to welcome a hero in a ticker tape parade or the spirit of a crowd that swarms down the street in anger, hell-bent on rioting, looting, or lynching. Now what happens in Luke chapter 4, it says quite clearly, Jesus began his public ministry, quote, filled with the power of the Spirit. The Spirit of God was in him. It was with him. It was empowering him. And that is something that's, that's good and faithful and very active. So the question remains, how do we recognize the power of the Spirit in our own lives? Can we too, as Presbyterians, live by the power of the Spirit? Now to begin to answer that question, I'm going to turn to a surprising source, namely, scientists who do research on the human brain. Now, I'm not an expert on this, but I want to try and summarize a few things. The neurons in the brain transmit information that literally goes to every part of the body, and this occurs through chemical messengers, or what are called neurotransmitters. Two of the common neurotransmitters are dopamine and serotonin. Dopamine is associated with feelings of being rewarded and being productive. Serotonin is associated with feelings of happiness or focus or peace. Now, there are things that you can do in your daily life. There are drugs and medicines you can take that will stimulate both dopamine and serotonin. But what researchers have found is that religious practice, prayer, worship, calming rituals also stimulate these same neurotransmitters. They physically activate the parts of the brain, for example, in the temporal lobe, that are important for all of our social relationships and for feeling a sense of trust. And at the same time, they deactivate other parts of the brain in the parietal lobe where our ego is dominant, diminishing that sense of self, me, and I. So what is happening is that through a life of faith, your brain is physically, literally being reminded that you are part of something bigger than yourself, that you are connected to something that transcends you and that connects you to all people, all creation. So what does that mean for this passage? It means that you can take in the spirit and simply breathe. You can exist as a creature, or you can be filled with the spirit and move as it directs you towards self-transcendence, towards this awareness and realization that we are interconnected and that the world has in it something far beyond us that is loving and trustworthy. This idea of the Holy Spirit moving in us and through us is at the heart of this very first sermon that Jesus preaches there in the Nazareth synagogue. As I said, the passage starts with the phrase, Jesus was filled with the power of the Spirit. And the truth of his being filled by the Spirit 
is seen in the passage that he chose. He opens the scroll, he unrolls it to Isaiah 61, and then he reads a passage that's not ego-centered, but other-centered. He reads a passage not about individuality, but about loving and just relationships. Listen to the words again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, anointing me to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim now the year of the Lord's favor. Now, that message is an incredibly Presbyterian message. All right, it's also an incredibly Episcopal message and Baptist and Lutheran and Catholic message, but it really does echo with certain parts of our Reformed theology. What it says to us is that our lives are a response of God's providence and spirit movement and grace. And so in that passage, God is promising to give us good news, to give us release and new vision, to give us freedom, and to enjoy the year of the Lord's favor. And that is also going to be true for others who will also be called to be healed and given new sight, to go out together as workers in a common harvest to do the Lord's work. This movement of the Spirit is not done so that we gain points that can be redeemed somewhere at a heavenly redemption desk, but instead that we might live on earth as it is in heaven. Your brain knows there is value in this. That is why it responds to this. And so does your heart. To be filled with the power of the Spirit is to trust these spiritual connections and like Christ himself did, to then step forward into the world to make them real here and now. Now, early this week, church member Mary Alice Lytle forwarded to me a copy of one of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s sermons. It was one that he preached on the very familiar theme of love your enemies. Now, you might assume that for Dr. King, that's a trite topic to preach on, but he routinely circled back to that theme because his own life and activity in the civil rights movement gave him fresh insights into the depth and the process involved in loving one's enemies. So in this sermon, King began by stressing that the first step in loving your enemies is actually to look honestly at yourself, to acknowledge the ways that we are mixtures of good and evil. And after we do that, then we can turn our gaze beyond us to those around us and admit that actually that same dynamic is true of them as well, that in, in the midst of the best of us, there is some evil. And in the midst of the worst of us, there remains some good. So King went on to say that once we acknowledge this universal shared condition, we are then called as people of faith to reject any opportunity to defeat our enemy, to take joy in their downfall or humiliation. To be filled with the power of the Spirit meant that we are to downplay our ego and selfishness and then move into a place of agape, sacrificial love, even for our enemies. Now to illustrate this point, then King gave a very simple and yet powerful illustration. He told about a time when he and his brother A.D. were driving from Atlanta up to Chattanooga. And as King tells the story, for some reason, the drivers that night were very discourteous, that routinely as they went down the highway, many of them refused to dim their headlights. King remembers that this agitated his brother, who finally in an angry tone said, I know what I'm going to do. The next car that comes along and refuses to dim their lights, I'm going to fail to dim mine and pour them on in all of their power. You've never felt that way, I know, on your own. 
But in the front seat of the car, King replied back to his brother, don't do that. There'd be too much light on the highway and it will end up in mutual destruction. Somebody's got to have some sense on this highway. Somebody's got to have some sense on this highway. So ask yourself, where does this sense come from? It doesn't just come from us. It comes to us from the one that is greater than us, the Holy One, eternal in the heavens, yet active in the here and now. It comes from being filled with the power of the Spirit. Now, to be clear, being filled with the Spirit is not a nonstop dopamine rush. It will often put us at odds with the world. We'll see that very clearly next week when we read the next verses in Luke 4. It's like the theologian Karl Barth once said, as followers of Christ, we speak when others are silent. We fall silent when words of sin are spoken. We confess when others deny. We stand when others falter. We adore when others blaspheme. We are at peace when others are restless, and we are often restless when others are at peace. And then Bart concluded by saying, to fold one's hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. So to conclude, long ago Jesus walked into that Nazareth synagogue filled with the power of the Spirit. Today you walked into this church, or maybe you quieted yourself at home to watch this service. Each of us, each of you, are filled with the Spirit's power. It gives you life, but much more than in just a simple passive breath. It opens you up, brain, body, soul, that you might live and accept the connection that you have with all life. And then it challenges you to be the one to bring some sense to this highway. It challenges you to accept and proclaim release and mercy and justice that the disorder of the world may finally come to an end. Friends, just as we exist with Christ, may we learn to say with Christ, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Breathe in, breathe out, and accept that good news. Thanks be to God. Amen.